All right, Shane. Hey, we'll get to our picks, I, I swear. But I uh, reached out to my buddy, <laughs> Trey Wallace from OutKick.com. Wanted to hit on a number of the topics around the SEC. Get his thoughts on some of the big games this weekend. So let's kick it over to our interview with Trey Wallace. All right, we're pleased now to be joined by Trey Wallace, of course, of OutKick.com. And you got to follow Trey for all SEC info and all the great work he's doing over there at OutKick at Trey Wallace underscore on Twitter. Trey, thanks for joining me, man. I've always wanted to have you on the show. No, this is great. I'm so, I'm so glad to be able to join you and, and talk SEC football, talk the craziness that's going on all around the country, and uh, you do a great job. And I'm, I'm happy to join you, man. This has been a long time coming. Yeah, absolutely. And well, speaking of a long time coming. I really wanted to get your thoughts on this. Uh, I know maybe some Tennessee fans are ready to turn the page already, but, uh, you know, I saw you have some pretty strong comments here when I don't even know the guy's name. I think it's Billy Lyons or something like that, but uh, Jeremy Pruitt's attorney who kind of came out here and and is threatening Tennessee and all these coaches and all that. What are your thoughts on on just that whole situation and, um, you know, kind of the the ploy that the lawyer's trying to, to pull here? You know, I, I think it's it's more or less you've got you've got an attorney who's who's, who's kind of dealt in cases kind of like this. He's he's running on the high from the David Beatty thing at at, at Kansas, and you know, I, I I think he was more or less trying to was trying to act like here's the best way to put it. He probably had like pocket eights, you know, and and he's trying to think that he he's trying to get Tennessee to think he has pocket aces. Right. Like that's the best thing, the best way that I can put it. Um, I think it was, you know, an effort to get, it was a scare tactic to get Tennessee to, to settle with him by that certain date, which was last Friday, uh, the, the 29th. And look, Tennessee wasn't budging on this thing. Um, they think that, you know, they, they don't need to, that they have enough. And I know they've got enough evidence that, that they don't need to, you know, to do any kind of um, mediation on it, if they don't or mediation on a settlement, if they don't think that they they need one, if they have the cause or whatnot, then that's that's all you need. I I don't like the whole. You know, why why are you threatening Rick Barnes? Why are you threatening the basketball program? Why are you threatening threatening to take down everybody else? And pretty much, you know, talking with people inside the college football community, you know, they view him as a rat. I mean, they, they really do. And, 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 you know, looking at it as well, you know, there is an unspoken rule, man. You don't, you don't divulge the secrets of wherever you've been, because mm-hmm. I promise you, Jeremy Pruitt's got secrets from Alabama that he doesn't want out there. And I know for a fact he does. So if, if you go down that road with Tennessee, I can promise you somewhere down the line, his past at Alabama and his past at Georgia or Florida state's going to get brought up and, and I just don't think he wants to go down that road. I, 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 you know, I would advise him not to if I was his attorney. But, you know, um, I think this is a guy that also knows that he's not going to be coaching in college football for a pretty long time. And uh, he's trying to get as much money as he can, um, you know, while he's doing some work in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Well, moving on from Jeremy Pruitt and you know, focusing on the, the program that, uh, that gave him the ax there in Knoxville. Any idea of you hearing anything? I know this is, um, you know, tough to get information on, but with the NCAA investigation in, in, into Tennessee, it's we're almost going on a year since you broke the news that, uh, you know, all that was going on and there was players getting sat out for, what was it, the Texas A&M game. So uh, any idea on when the NCAA will will kind of conclude the investigation there into Tennessee's program. Well, you know, I, I think Tennessee's part of this thing uh, with with Michael Glazer and whatnot. I, I think that's coming in for a landing. Um, now it's all going to be, you know, and, and look, here's the thing too. The NCAA is, well, let me rephrase that. The attorneys in Tennessee have let the NCAA in on their investigation mm-hmm. and, and what they've come up with. You know, it's pretty much been step by step. Um We'll see how that pays off. You know, you look at the Oklahoma State thing that happened with the basketball situation, and you kind of scratch your head a little bit. But Tennessee's been very transparent um, with, with you know, the lawyers that are representing them, and then also 
I mean, NCAA in this case. And, you know, Tennessee's already Tennessee's already done a few things uh, on their own when it comes to self-imposing, kind of making things a little easier on them, you know, when it comes down to a potential punishment that's either imposed by themselves or imposed by the NCAA. So Tennessee's trying to stay ahead of this thing as much as possible, and I think that's very smart on their part. Um, so when you look at it now, you know, uh, when does the NCAA bring up something? Well, I mean, you know, we've seen how long the NCAA takes when it comes to cases nowadays. I, I think more than anything, you'll see Tennessee, you know, present something in their own right and self-impose themselves. And, you know, in, in my opinion, and talking with folks, you know, if they self-impose something, the NCAA is going to know about it three weeks before they do it. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. So it's not going to come as some kind of surprise or anything along those type of lines. So, you know, I, I think we're, I honestly think we're getting close. Um, and um, I, I think that, um, I think that, that this thing will, will end up wrapping up. I don't want to say the NCAA part wrapping up sometime soon, but I do think Tennessee's part of it potentially will. So we'll find out. Mm -hmm. Possibly the biggest story right now in the SEC, Florida, Dan Mullen, his future down there in Gainesville. If uh, anybody's missed it, head on over to outkick.com. Trey uh, had a really good article on Dan Mullen this week. So I wanted to ask you, what do you see the future there in Gainesville? Do you think Dan Mullen is going to survive all this? And I certainly think he needs to win these last four games, which the Gators should be a huge favorite in, in every game they've got remaining on the schedule. And if he does stay, I mean, I, I guess we're going to see massive coaching change on his staff, I would think. What's your read on the situation down there? Yeah, uh, Mullen's not going anywhere this year. Uh, you know, he, he's got the support of Scott Strickland down there at Florida. But I, I say that to say this, you, you better win your next four games. Mm -hmm. You know, don't. Better not be losing in Columbia on Saturday night. Uh, your best, you know, you're not going to lose a Sanford, but you know, you you've still got, if I'm not mistaken, Missouri and, mm -hmm. and Florida State. Um, so, look, you you look at this squad, and it just feels like, and maybe this is not going on, but from the outside looking in, kind of feels like some of the players have maybe checked out a little bit. Um, and look, when you're when you're when you're the Florida Gators and you're out of the SEC East running by week four, week five of the season, um, that's not something that, 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 that should be happening in Gainesville. Um, you know, usually the SEC East should be, you know, if it's not decided with Tennessee in years past, you know, um, and I'm talking years past, but if it's not decided then, you know, maybe it's decided in Jacksonville. Or maybe it's decided, you know, during that last month of the season. And we haven't seen that. Um, you know, Florida did win the East last year. I thought the whole conference was a train wreck at times. Um, but you you look at what they've done since the end of last season compared to all right now. I mean, what, they're two and seven against, you know, um, power five opponents. Um, and, and, and I just, I think this is something that Florida fans are fed up with. And I completely understand that part of it. Um, because if Florida, you know, they're supposed to be competing for national championships. And it's been a minute since Florida's competed for a national championship. Um, and it also comes down to recruiting. I think the problem with Dan Mullen is that sometimes he just puts his foot in his mouth mm -hmm. when he shouldn't. And if you would just stop doing that, I don't know if it – I mean, look, it would be – it'd be bad because fans are agitated with the losses, but it wouldn't be as bad as it looks now. And, and, you know, he comes on the SEC teleconference and, you know, he, he gives a statement before talking about, oh, how I, I didn't mean to say this about recruiting. We're always recruiting, blah, 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 blah. Well, when it comes down to it, you got to prove it, man. You know, you've lost two four stars in the last two and a half weeks. Um, your recruiting class is ranked uh, right now 22nd in the country, ninth in the SEC. Um, and, and, and I just don't think that's, that's, that's up to Florida Gator standards. Um, you know, you, you look at Dan Mullen as a whole, and I, and I think the biggest thing, too, is you're not in Starkville anymore. Like, you, you can't go out and win eight to nine games and think fans are going to be happy. In Starkville, 
yeah, they'll be happy with eight to nine wins per season. And, you know, maybe that 10 win season thrown in there and, you know, you're playing in a, a new year six bowl once every five years, something like that. In, in Florida, you expect to do that every single year. And, and when you don't, and when you have years like, you know, where, where you, you go to Lexington and get beat, or you go to, to Baton Rouge and get beat against a team that whose coach was pretty much already gone. Um, you know, they decided to, uh, to resign the next day and coach, Oh, you know, there's just small things that are going on with this program. And I think people were agitated because look how they played against Florida in the second half. And then look where their season has gone since. So, you know, I don't think Dan's going anywhere this year. I think he's going to have to hire some new coaches. Um, I think that's going to be pretty obvious. And, you know, when you hire new coaches, you think it gives you a two-year window to kind of turn things around. But I'll say this, the coaches that get hired at Florida need to, you know, and I, and I know they will, a lot of it might be for a payday because they're, they're coming in and they might be gone in two years. You just never know with this conference. And, and, and you know this, when you've got boosters and you've got people in the athletic department that are tired of, of what you've been putting out, things can go south pretty quick. So I'm just saying, don't go to Columbia and lose Saturday night because it will not be pretty if you do. Who would you hire if you, if you were making the hire down there at LSU right now? Mel Tucker is a name that I am hearing they're very interested in. I think Lane Kiffin certainly would be the splash that uh, Scott Woodward likes to make, but uh, he's keeping this thing pretty close to the vest. So who do you think is the best candidate for uh, one of the best jobs in the entire country? You know, I'm, I'm going to stick, and I know he's lost – couple games but I, i'm gonna stick with james franklin right now um and and, and and there's close seconds behind him maybe 1a 1b um you know mel tucker's a nice candidate but i, I look at franklin and 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 what he did first off what he did at vanderbilt um and and being able to 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 have them as a talk of the SEC for a couple of years, you know, with the way they were playing. And then you go up to Penn State and, you know, you're you're playing good football, then you mix in a bad season here or there. And, you know, you're gonna have that over eight to nine years. You know, it's not it's not Nick Saban where, you know, you're you're going to the, the, the college football playoff every year. It, it, it's really it's not like that. Um I think the Big Ten is is pretty darn competitive when you you've got teams like Ohio State and you got Michigan and you know, even Wisconsin, um, you know, they're Michigan State. So I, I just, to me, it feels like he, he really turned that program around up in Happy Valley, mm -hmm. and he got them to a really good point. Um, and I think he could do that in the SEC again. I, I honestly do. If, if Look, if he could recruit at Vanderbilt, you can recruit at LSU. And the thing about LSU is that's not a turnaround job. LSU is a job where you come in and you can win immediately because of what you have in that state when it comes to recruiting, what you have with the resources, the boosters, whatnot, you name it. Um, so I think Franklin, you know, would, would be, you know, an interesting candidate in my opinion uh, to be looked at uh, sincerely for that job. I, I think, you know, other than that, yeah, Mel Tucker is, Mel Tucker's done good at Michigan State since he's been there. But my question is, is LSU that type of job for Mel Tucker? Meaning, you know, is, uh, is Mel Tucker a big enough splash for LSU? Like, that's the thing it, 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 that triggers my head. Because you've got to go out and you've got to hit a home run. This is not a job that somebody comes in and uh, they're not new to the conference, but this is not a learning on the job type of thing. You need somebody that's been there before and who's done it. Same thing like Texas A&M did with Jimbo. Or, you know, I, I I would say maybe the same thing that Ohio State did with Ryan Day. Ryan Day's been around that program for so long, he understood it, so it was an easy transition for him. Um, but I don't know if somebody – I don't know if LSU going out and hire Billy Napier is going to be the answer because I don't know if Billy Napier can win at the SEC level. And I get, look, you got to be there to be able to prove it. But I just don't know, just because Billy Napier is in your backyard and Louisiana Lafayette's been pretty decent these last number of years, I don't know if that's a candidate you go after. And then lastly, you know, you brought up Lane Kiffin. I, I don't I don't think Scott Woodard is going to hire Lane Kiffin. 
Um, do we hear Lane Kiffin's name? Absolutely. Because you know who his agent is. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that Lane Kiffin's going to get a bump in pay in Oxford. But right now, I don't, I don't think he's the right fit for everything that's going on. And you know some of the stuff. I, I just don't feel like Lane Kiffin would be a, a candidate for what's going on and what they're trying to rebuild in Baton Rouge. Do you think this Alabama team is capable of winning the national title after – you know, we've seen them barely survive the swamp, and it looks like Florida may not be that good. The Tennessee game, I know the final score is a little lopsided, but if you watch that game, and I know you did, uh, Tennessee gave them a – if Tennessee had a full roster, maybe they would have won that game. And, of, of course, uh, the Crimson Tide have already lost to Texas A&M. So what's your thoughts on this uh, Alabama team? Do, do they have the pieces to win it all? I think they're kind of lacking right now in the secondary. I think I think at one linebacker position, they're not as sturdy as they need to be. Um, the biggest thing with me about Alabama this year too is they don't have that they don't have that explosive guy at wide receiver like we've seen in the past. You know, whether it be Devonta Smith or you know or or or, or, or Rugs or something along those lines. You know, you. They don't have that right now. You don't have a guy that, that that's just downfield, crazy, explosive speed. Um, they've got talent. Don't get me wrong, and they've got a little bit of separation. But I think you know I, I'm interested to see how this Alabama team does in these last four weeks against opponents that maybe could expose them over the middle a little bit, on, over the top of the linebackers, mm-hmm. um, because you saw what Tennessee was able to do. So there were just a lot of mistakes in the secondary for Alabama, and it was unlike teams in the past. So I, I you know, I, I think that's one of their shortfalls this year is having fast enough safeties. Um, and then also, I, I don't think, you know, there are times we've seen Henry Toa Toa, you know, get beat you know, across the middle and, and miss assignments and whatnot. And I'm not knocking him. Henry's a really good player. But he's not a Dylan Moses type player. You know, he, he's not that type of linebacker. I, I, I just feel like they have a couple weaknesses. I, look, there's a reason they're in the top four in the college football playoff. Okay, rankings. They're, they're a good football team. Um, but I think if Georgia were to play Alabama on Saturday, I think Georgia would win by 10 points or more mm-hmm. um, just because of their defense. So we're going to really find out because – As you noticed, you know, during games this year, Bryce Young is not the crazy runner. You know, he don't don't want to run the ball. You know, he'd rather sit back in the pocket and pass. So if you put pressure on him and force him to to make any kind of mistakes, then you've set yourself up in in prime real estate, uh, you know, in in different field positions. So I I look at Alabama right now, and I just think they have some work to do. I think they're good enough to win it all but they've still got pieces to put together on the offensive side and on the defensive side. And, and once they do that, you know, maybe in four weeks they can beat Georgia in Atlanta. But as of right now, I, you know, a lot of people seem to forget Auburn is still hanging in there and can actually win the West if they, you know, take care of their business and then, you know, win the Iron Bowl. Mm-hmm. Now you just you referenced Georgia there. Is, it, is anybody going to test them this year or is it – Finally, that magical run that uh, these fans have been dying for. I know they, they taste it. Now that the Braves have won it all, now they want them Georgia Bulldogs to uh, bring home the title. Do you think it happens? Do you think this is the year the 1980 jokes finally come to an end? Unfortunately, I don't know if somebody had to sell their soul to the devil <laughs> for them to get a Braves a championship. And then, like, <laughs> I mean – Come on now. I mean, the football, (laughs) do the sports gods give the state of Georgia two championships in one year? Um, (laughs) Logically, I'd say no. Um, But but I'll say this about Georgia. Uh, They should win out the remaining of the games in the regular season. Um, They'll be tested in the SEC title game, but it really won't, you know, it won't matter. Even if they drop the game, even if they drop that game to Alabama, they're, they're still going to be playing in the college football playoff. I, but I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think Georgia, uh, their defensive line is way too strong. You've seen that. Uh, their offensive line, the way they're able to open up holes and get that running game going with Zamir White right now or even Cook, you know, as Kendall Milton recovers from a knee injury, um, they, they, they really didn't have to break off any kind of plan against Florida. We, we, we've seen this football team 
be dominant on both lines of scrimmage. And then also, you know, I like what Georgia has at the secondary and the linebacking group. You know, and, and when you – you know, a lot of people ask me about the quarterback situation, and, and I tell them, man, you don't break up something that's working right now. Like, Stetson Bennett is working. Now, there might come a time this season where Georgia feels like they need to pass the ball around a little more. And if that time comes, maybe they throw JT Daniels into the mix. But as of right now, Stetson Bennett's done his thing. This is a kid who's shown a little speed getting outside the pocket, scrambling down the field. Um, we saw it against Florida. We definitely saw it when they played Georgia. Um, and, and also he can sell the play action, and he can hit his guys in stride. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to see them get a little healthier when it comes to maybe Darnell Washington. You know, at, at, at that tight end spot, if he can get healthier, that's just another weapon for them. But I think right now, offensively, this this football team is playing extremely well. They're relying on their running game to set up the play action in the pass game. And, and I think that's the way Georgia needs to play. And look, nobody's been able to stop it. You know, I, I know Georgia came out with a flurry to end that first half against Florida, but what did they do in the second half? They just ran the football. Mm-hmm. Um, they took care of business. Florida couldn't stop them. You know, Florida couldn't get them off the field. So, you know, I, I look at Georgia right now as a superior team in college football. There's a reason why they're number one. It's because they're that good. And when you have a defensive line like that where you only have to bring four, you don't need to bring five or six guys to put pressure on the quarterback. Hell, you could probably bring three guys to put pressure on the quarterback. I think when you have that kind of momentum and you have that kind of talent, I think it carries you a long way, and I think that's what we're seeing out of the dogs this year. All right, Trey, last thing. I really appreciate all your time. I just want to get a couple uh, quick game predictions here for, uh, yeah. in my opinion, the three biggest games in the SEC this weekend, starting with uh, Auburn at Texas A&M. Who you got winning that one? Hmm. I, you know what? I, I think it's going to be Auburn. I think Auburn goes mm-hmm. into College Station, and I think Auburn is um, – I'm going to kind of go with a little bit of an upset here. I, I think that – Bo Nix is, is playing pretty darn good football right now. And, and that's going to be a big game. And, and, and it reminds me of the game they had in College Station. It was five years ago, if I'm not mistaken, um, where they both came in pretty highly ranked. Um, you, you look at this matchup, and, and, and I think Texas A&M is, is, is good offensively with Spiller at running back. Calzada has figured out his way. But I think there's something about Bo Nix and Tank Bigsby right now. And I think the defense is actually playing pretty darn well. Um, so I, I, I'm calling for Auburn to go into a and pull the upset this weekend. Mm. How about this one? Mississippi State at Arkansas. Arkansas coming off a bye. They need a win pretty desperately. Yeah, Arkansas, um, after starting off pretty hot, they've gone through the ringer uh, the, the last month. Um, I think Mississippi State passes the ball too much. Um, now, will that work against Arkansas and, and Barry Odom? We're going to find out because Barry Odo, if he's smart, he just plays two high safeties and tries to keep things in front of him. But, man, you can't really deny what Will Rogers is doing right now at Mississippi State, slinging the football around. Um, you know, 39 attempts last week in the upset against Kentucky, completed, I think, 36 of them. He had 57 attempts against Vanderbilt. Um, this offense is kind of rolling right now. And uh, I'm going to continue riding with the Bulldogs until somebody derails them. So I got, I got Mississippi State beating Arkansas. Mm. All right, two upsides. Let's see, two road teams you're going with here. How about finally Tennessee at Kentucky? Used to be the battle for the beer barrel. They need to bring that thing back. Who you got winning the game? Who, man, this is tough. I've gone back and forth all week on this. Um, if 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 Tennessee is able to figure out a way to stop the running game with Chris Rodriguez and Cavassier Smoke, then I think it sets up real nice for Tennessee to go in there uh, and, 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 and grab a win. Um, I think Tennessee's offense is extremely fast. And my biggest thing is, you know, if, if Kentucky had problems stopping Mississippi State's offense, which is somewhat fast, but it's more or less them getting up to the line of scrimmage and passing the ball, mm-hmm. I'm very interested to see how Kentucky's going to stop a, a team like Tennessee who has Tyon Evans coming back at running back. They'll have Jabari Small healthy. You're going to have an offensive line that's healthy with Cade Mays returning and, and Cooper Mays that's healthy. Um, and then the X factor is Hendon Hooker, you know, him getting outside the pocket, making plays with his feet. He's had two weeks to get that knee kind of healed up. Um, so I, 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 you know, right now I, I, I'm going to go ahead and pick Tennessee. I think they win like a close one. 
uh, you know, 31, 27, something along those lines right now. I, I just, I got this feeling that even though Kentucky is saying they're very agitated and whatever, I'm going to use that kind of language about their loss to, to Mississippi state. I think we've also noticed that maybe Kentucky's offense is not all that everybody has kind of propped up over the last two months. Mm -hmm. Um, because we've seen if they can't run the football, they are not going to have success. And, 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 you know, Tennessee is, they might look, Tennessee doesn't have the best linebacking core in the country, but they got enough bodies along the defensive line, at least, um, if they, if they wanted to try to stop Rodriguez and smoke. But I will say this, Tennessee will play one of the toughest offensive lines that they've played this season in Kentucky. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if Kentucky wins this game, okay, at all. But right now, with the pace, the way Tennessee plays football, I, I'm just going with them by four points this weekend. Ooh, all right. You made uh, a lot of people happy here in the state of Tennessee. He's Trey Wallace of Outkick.com. <laughs> Got to give him a follow at Trey Wallace underscore on Twitter. Thank you so much, Trey. I really, really appreciate you joining the show. My brother, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Shane. Just want to say thanks again to Trey for hopping on the line here and you know, he does an outstanding job there for OutKick. He's been covering many SEC schools over the years. He's the one that broke the news that Tennessee and Jeremy Pruitt was under investigation. He's the one that broke the news that them Florida Gators were having that credit card scandal all them years uh -huh. ago. So, uh, I mean, he, he's breaking news left and right. So I, I really do appreciate Trey joining us here. Absolutely, man. I appreciate the hot takes, too. <laughs>